Welcome everybody to TV Toastmasters. We are so glad you've come back. And today I have a wonderful person to introduce you to. Her name is Tootie Smith. If you're from Clackamas County, you might already know that name. She was a county commissioner for several years. Tootie is a speaker, she's an author, she uh, is the president of corporations, she's a beekeeper, she has a bed and breakfast place, she was the first woman in the Oregon legislature, and she was the second woman, I have to read here because there's so much about her I can't remember at all, she was um, the second woman who was won the primary for the Congress in Congressional District 5. She also was dubbed a spark plug by her fellow colleagues because she took on things and she was like a dog and she never dropped them. And now she has written an amazing book and it's called Pay to Play. So Tootie, welcome. It's so great to have you here. Thanks, Annalise. I look forward to talking about this book, Pay to Play, um, Sexual Harassment, American Style talks to a lot of issues that we're dealing with right now in the country. So here's a question I have for you that I've been thinking about as I was reading the book. You did all of these other things, and now why this book? I've been in politics, business, and journalism for about 30 years. Mm -hmm. And reflecting back on what I wanted to do at this point in my life, I've always wanted to write. I started thinking about the things that I have heard about, mm -hmm. the things that I have seen, and the things that I have felt. And those are resonating right now in the headlines with the sexual harassment cases that are, that are just epidemic proportions. Mm -hmm. And I took a step back and said, well, yeah, I've been there, I've seen that, and I, and I have dealt with it. So in this book, and then through my other speaking engagements, mm -hmm. I show people how to recognize it, mm -hmm. how to deal with it, how to stop it, and then move forward for prosperous lives. So you actually sat down to write this book, which I think in itself is astonishing, because of all those things you just told me. Mm -hmm. And then you decided to speak about it. Did you, were you going to speak about it when you wrote the book, or did you write it and then say, okay, now I need to speak about it? Well, I just love to write. Okay. I just love to write, and the book just flowed out of me. Mm -hmm. there, in the book, there's histories, how we got here. And I think it's important as we move forward to this issue is explain how we got here mm -hmm. so we can figure out how to fix it uh, as we move forward. I do want to speak about it because I think I have a lot to offer. Mm -hmm. And women, um, especially uh, some of our younger women mm -hmm. who have just now starting to deal with this in their workplaces, need to understand how to deal with it and put a stop to it fix a problem and move forward. So you are, so your plan is you have this wonderful book, you're going to go out and you're, or you already have been, mm -hmm. speaking to organizations, to companies, to politicians perhaps, since yes. you're in the political world. Yes. I'm thinking you have a lot of connections there. Yes. And you're going to talk about this and in your talking about it, what would you want them to know about what's different about you? What are you bringing to this? Well, I'm bringing a lot of experience to it. Mm -hmm. I don't bash anybody. Mm -hmm. I recognize this is a problem, I think, mm -hmm. because of maybe misunderstanding of the roles in mm -hmm. America right now. Sexual harassment is a form of bullying. Yes, absolutely. Sexual harassment is a behavior. Mm -hmm. Behavior is a choice. We choose whether mm -hmm. we want to sexually harass, abuse, or rape or not. Likewise, the victims, mm -hmm. or most cases they're women, although not always, mm -hmm. have a role to play in that too. I teach women how to stand up to mm -hmm. recognize it. I've had instances in my life where something had happened to me, I walk away and I thought to myself, oh my gosh, did that just happen? Yes. To me, is that what I think what happened? Yes. And don't let it pass. Now we're so fortunate because there's been so much written about this mm -hmm. that we no longer have to work in a place mm -hmm. where there's a power differential that we're afraid to lose our jobs or afraid to report it. So tell me something. When this happened to you, I'm really intrigued by this, because I know I read it in the book, but I can't exactly remember. There were so many wonderful um, uh, stories in the book about this. So when, it, when something happened to you where you stopped after it happened and said, wait a minute, wait a minute, did that really just happen? Did you ever have to go back and talk to the person or talk to the people or... How did you... What I did is I went back and I said, you know that thing that you said to me, we're going to mm -hmm. do never again. I love it. Never again. Okay. And then I took on a persona. In certain instances, I took on body language, and mm -hmm. I can teach that. And, and you just have to be able to present yourself in a certain way and, and move forward. But that doesn't always work. Right. That doesn't always work. Right. Um, 
so if it, it doesn't always work, what would you say to women who are trying to bring this out or trying to tell and are getting trapped in sort of the whole Well, first system. of all, don't be silent about it. Okay, there you go. Don't yeah. be silent about it. Yeah. Tell somebody in your work environment. Right. Now, we look at the headlines of Hollywood and the United States Congress and all these businesses mm -hmm. with all these media uh, men who've been accused of this, and that looks like one thing, but if you're working in a school mm -hmm. or a, an office situation mm -hmm. or a factory, sexual harassment may look very different there depending on the company culture. Mm -hmm. It all has to do with the company culture. Right. So if you see that and if you feel that, go to your HR department, go mm -hmm. to your immediate supervisor, tell a colleague. Mm -hmm. Tell a colleague so they can be on the lookout for that. Then once you report it, yes. it's up to the company to take action because sexual harassment is against the law. Yes. It's against the I law. Know. Companies no longer can get away with it looking the other way. If your company doesn't do anything about it, go to the police authorities. If that doesn't work, yeah. and I say in my book, <laughs> we now have the social megaphone right. of social media yes. out there, yes. and nobody can survive that. That's nobody right. can survive that. You can go to that. If you don't want to be that um, outrageous, mm -hmm. I want to say, try to handle it internally in your situation. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, if the penalties at your workplace are so um, over the top for right. it, it, that if a person automatically gets fired for right. sexual harassment, studies show that women won't report it. Oh, that is interesting. I find that very interesting. It's still women just won't do these things. But mm -hmm. if there's a situation where a woman just wants to show up to work, right. do her job, and be left alone, right. That should be allowed in this country. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Another thing that I've that I've noticed in America today, we're living under these two different dichotomies in our mm -hmm. society. We have very strong sexual mores and inhibitions against sexual harassment, right. abuse, and rape. And then on the other hand, we have the sexualization oh, of women yes. in our advertising, in our fashion, yes. in, in our media. In everything. To advertise, oh, to flaunt this, to flaunt that. And no wonder the roles are being confused. You know, you said in something in the book, you talk about the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, which I thought was just wonderful. Would you like to tell us a little bit about that? Well, this is last year. I turned on mm -hmm. the television and watched the parade. In the background, there was a two-story figure of a Victoria's Secret ads of mm -hmm. two women in bras. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, the camera angle is certainly going to move that. This is a family program on Thanksgiving Day, of all things. As the two-hour show progressed, uh -huh. not one effort was made to deviate from that. Marching bands marched in front of them. It was in the background. The floats, the kids. And I thought, well, you know, that's product placement. That's yes. a paid advertisement yes. of sexualization of women. women. Yes. Two uh, weeks yes. later, Matt Lauer, who was a narrator of that program, was outed for his sexual right. misdeeds on his right. work. Right. No wonder. It, it, it permeates in our culture. It permeates in our culture. And then what happens is it tells our youth and our girls and our boys coming up, yeah, this is what women are about. This yes. is sexualization of women. And I think we need to look at this at a lot of different angles. Mm -hmm. I agree. A lot of different angles. Yes. And you also talked about in, um, in your book, we have a little bit more time, you talked about that you feel like America is in a spiritual crisis. Can you say something about that? I do. I do think America is in a spiritual, tri in a spiritual crisis because we're failing to do the right thing. Yes. Sexual harassment is wrong. Mm -hmm. Usually a power different yes. exists. It is always initiated mm -hmm. and it is always felt. Yes, yes. I have some personal experience of that in my life and I would agree, I would agree with you about that as people are I'm not sure if they're not feeling like it's wrong anymore or they're not wanting it to be wrong or they don't care. I'm not really sure what it is, but yes, I totally agree with you. And then it gets to a point where it gets out of hand. It gets out of <laughs> for hand. For sure, for sure. It gets out of hand. And companies and organizations and all groups really need to look at it and take a step back and let somebody talk about it. Don't be afraid to talk about sexual harassment. A lot of people are afraid oh. to admit that it exists. Absolutely. I think, I think women are afraid to say it happened to them. And I think other men are, in fact, you talk about this in the book, other men are afraid to speak out to other men. Because if you're a man and you're in that culture where people are, men are behaving like that and you say something, then you, you're you not one of the boys anymore and you're That's not in really the club true. and you're not whatever. I mean, did you find that in politics? Like oh, the, very much so. But 
I had really good men yeah. on my side to help me. And I, and I call out more good men to come and help women like mm -hmm. us help solve the problem. Yeah. There were a lot of men in, because I was, I fly in a man's world with yeah, politics so and journalism, and I really like it. I credit so many men helping me with my career. Mm -hmm. And there are good men out there who will help with this situation. We just need to give them the tools, the how-tos to do it. And is this what you're going to do when you are going to speak, when you go to speak at organizations yes. and companies? Yes, I actually show them what sexual harassment looks like. We get a chance to role play because mm -hmm. unless you walk in somebody else's shoes, you really don't know what they feel. I teach people how to intervene if they see a situation. And, yes. And the EEOC has guidelines for this. Mm -hmm. And in my book, there's a lot of uh, how-tos, uh, resources to mm -hmm. go to. So if you buy the book, you can read the book and do it yourself. You can <laughs> Perhaps not as effectively as you coming to speak to us. Because <laughs> I do believe in the book you said, you said that this is, you're not, that organizations have people in to train their employees from the perspective of how not to have a lawsuit. But this is different because you're going to go talk to the employees and the the organizations about how to stop the actual behavior. Right, and teach people how to behave in the yes, workplace. Because we don't exactly know that. Yes, that's very true. So I think this is an absolutely amazing thing that you're doing. And I was reading the book, I have to say, I was first very uh, sad because there's so much information about here about what's happening and true stories and all that and then uplifted at the end to say no no we can do something about this yes and i hope that people understand that message we are responsible for this we can change the course mm -hmm. of if we don't like something in this country we have freedom of speech we have all these rights we, we can, can change the course oh, that's wonderful well, Tootie, I thank you so much for coming. If people are curious about oh, me, yes. they can go to my yeah. website, tootiesmith.com, okay. send me an email. The book there, go to Amazon. It's on Amazon and in bookstores. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you all for watching another episode of TV Toastmasters with Tootie Smith. We hope to see you back the next time. Take care. Good evening, welcome back to our show. Tonight we're gonna to be talking about the youth in our community, um, some of the emerging trends that are going on with them, and also a very important institution within Clackamas County that's addressing the needs of kids in trouble. I'm joined tonight by Greg Newman from Parrot Creek uh, Family and Child Services, who are celebrating their 50th anniversary. So Greg, welcome to the program. Thank you. Uh, you're really, uh, Parrot Creek is? I'm the director of clinical services. Okay. I started out as a uh, parent trainer in a program uh, that actually we don't have uh, in existence anymore. And then I moved to a therapist at the residential program and I've, I've moved up to the director of clinical services. Okay. So tell us, what is Parrot Creek? Parrot Creek is a child and family service uh, nonprofit agency. Uh, we've been around for 50 years. This is our 50th anniversary. And our services have centered around working with youth and families who are involved with the juvenile justice system. So we have, at this time, five programs, some of them outpatient, two residential programs. And we deal with youth who are entering the juvenile justice system from the very beginning to, unfortunately, being fairly well submerged into it. Mm -hmm. And a variety of services, uh, mostly centered around uh, treatment and therapy to help the youth uh, get out of their entanglements with the juvenile justice system, regardless of how much in-depth they are into it. Okay, so you're doing both residential and outpatient Correct. treatment. Okay. Right. How does a child get into that system? How does, a, how does a child come to you? Well, it depends on the program, but uh, like one of our first programs that is going to be dealing with kids in the very front end is our diversion program. In those cases, a child has some sort of brushing with the law. They're referred to the juvenile department, the juvenile justice department. And at that point, if the Justice Department thinks it's a good fit, they will contact us and they will refer that youth to the diversion program. And they come in and meet with members of the community and they get to take accountability for their offense and find out ways that they can offer reparations. It's based upon a restorative justice model, which the idea being instead of looking at punishment for an offense, trying to find a way of getting the perpetrator of said offense to be involved in the process of 
doing restitution, not necessarily in a monetary sense, sometimes in a service sense, mm -hmm. sometimes just in a sense of working with those who they have harmed and understanding what it is that their actions um, have brought about and what they can do about it. Okay, so the diversion program, so you're probably talking about fairly minor infractions, Absolutely. misdemeanors. And, yeah. In this case, it's actually taking the place of a kid actually getting charged with something. So it's, it's really their, their first encounters, and it would be, yes, something that's not uh, too severe an infraction. Mm -hmm. Do you deal with kids who've been through, um, charged with serious offenses? Yes, we do. Uh, we have other programs that deal with that. We have a outpatient program that works with youth who have had uh, offensive behaviors of a sexual nature, and they uh, have been deemed by the Justice of the Juvenile Department to be appropriate for outpatient care. And then we have our two residential programs. One of them is a short-term uh, shelter and evaluation program, and its purpose is to, it's about 90 days long, its purpose is to, when a youth has come into the Clackamas County Juvenile Department, that's with the contract with Clackamas County, mm -hmm. um, we do an assessment and evaluation on that youth and try to recommend to the youth and his family as well as the Juvenile Department what kind of services they might need. Mm -hmm. And then we have a long-term residential program. These are youth who've actually gone into the custody of the state. They've been involved in the process for a while and they've gotten to the point where they actually have gone into the custody of the state so that the state can then put them with one of their nonprofit providers. And that's what we are. We are our alternative to jail at that point. Instead of a kid going to jail, he'll come into a residential center like ours and hopefully after going through uh, months of treatment and uh, behavior modification work and working hopefully with his family, the youth is able to go back into the community. In some cases, we see youth in the long-term residential program who've actually been in jail. Those youth are on parole. parole but a program is considered necessary before they go back into the community because going from jail to an open community is quite a startling uh, mm -hmm. process. Yeah. And even if a kid's only been incarcerated for a matter of months, you'd be amazed how fast they acclimate to that process and how challenging it would be to then go back into the community. Okay. So uh, how many, you say residential program, how many, at any one time, how many kids do you have in your residential program? In the shelter and evaluation program, we can take up to six. We have a dormitory on the same campus as our long-term residential program. It's about 80 acres just outside of Oregon City or right on the, on the mm -hmm. border. And the residential program can take up to 20. Okay. So it, I, I'm imagining then that there are other organizations like Parrot Creek around because 26 doesn't seem like enough to handle all the kids that are necessary. Yet. Indeed, the number of programs in the state has fluctuated over the years. It's, it's a, at a bit of a low now. This is not an area of my expertise, but I do know that it's at a bit of a low right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and yes, there are other uh, places around the state that, that do this process. And because of that, because our contract for the long-term residential is with the Oregon Youth Authority, we can get youth in our program who come from all over the state as well. Mm -hmm. The shelter program, as I say, is a Clackamas County contract, but the, the residential program can have youth from all over the state. So you mentioned youth and families. Do you, are you working with the families as well? Whenever possible. That's part of our philosophy. You can take a kid and stick him somewhere and do the most fantastic work with him in the world, and that if he goes back to the exact same environment, mm -hmm. the chances of him going back to the exact same behaviors are very high. And this is not to blame families. It's simply to say that when any of us have habituated to a behavior in a particular environment and you go back into that environment and nothing has changed, it's very, very hard yeah. to change. Adult uh, addictions understands this. They will oftentimes advise people who are just starting on the recovery process of addictions to change your routines. Don't drive the same way home. Don't go to the same places. Don't sit down in the same chair every night doing the same thing. You need to change your environment so that you have different stimuli to help change those habits. The same thing can be true with behaviors that we think of as being choices like breaking the law. Yes, there is absolutely an element of choice and you have made this decision for a reason. They're not just bad kids. In fact, that's something that's kind of important at Pear Creek the idea that we believe that youth are doing the best they can under the circumstances and that they would like to learn how to do things better. So that must be difficult at times if you're working with the parents and they think, oh, the problem is the kid. Mm -hmm. It's not us as the family. Right? Do you encounter that a lot? Absolutely. It, and mm -hmm. also a lot of defenses on family parts because their child has been taken from their custody. Mm -hmm. They ought to understandably feel like they're under the microscope. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, a lot of these families are under a significant amount of pressure themselves, socioeconomic issues. There may be transgenerational issues about addiction or mental health or other things like that. Mm -hmm. But we get kids from all sorts of families. So it's, it's not just coming from families that are, are suffering from those kind of challenges, although I would say a majority of our youth are. But yes, you're right. The first thing that you need to do under those circumstances, just like you have to do with the kid, is you have to build an alliance. And you have to try to convince folks, mm -hmm. we're actually in this together. 
and we want to work on it with you. We're not against you. We want to be partners in trying to have an outcome that we all want to have. Mm -hmm. um, success rates, do you keep track of that? Like when, it, when a kid leaves your residential program, right. or what's the recidivism rate? Well, the recidivism rate actually comes from the OIA, and they get out, put out every few years. The last recidivism rates that we have at our disposal were about 11.5%, which is extraordinarily uh, good when you consider the fact that when kids just go to corrections, the recidivism rate hovers between 40 and 50%. Yeah. And this is true of residential treatment uh, centers across the nation. Residential treatment works. That's why mm -hmm. we do it. If you're looking at this recidivism rate, it works. Uh, depending on their offenses, some offenses, the recidivism rate is even lower. Um, however, the OIA and Parrot Creek for a while now has begun to realize that there are other things to look at just besides recidivism. So we're just now in the process of starting to try to work out a way of tracking our clients after they leave our program and looking at other issues besides recidivism. Um, how does the relationship with their family, how did that develop? Mm -hmm. Did they continue and finish their education? Have they become employed? How do they rate their own quality of life? Issues that give a fuller picture of what um, maybe their time in treatment, what kind of effect it's had. Okay. So let's talk about you for a second. Okay. The work that you're doing represents a major career change right in midlife, right? <laughs> yes, it did. Okay. Uh, you were mentioning before that you were mostly involved as a laborer. Yes. Yeah. And then becoming a clinical social worker. What was the motivation? What changed? Uh, well, to tell you the truth, uh, I was doing all that physical labor because I thought I was going to become a rich rock and roll star. What do you know? <laughs> that didn't happen. The chances are amazing, but that didn't work out. Mm -hmm. And so at a certain point, I realized that I was doing the work just to fulfill that dream. Mm -hmm. And I also began to realize at a certain point that, uh, especially the last physical labor work I was doing, which was construction, that my favorite part of the job was dealing with the clients, who can get very stressed out when you're remodeling their bathroom, as a matter of fact. Yeah. And the actual putting up of walls and such, for me personally, wasn't the fulfilling part. It was the talking to the people. And that made me think about what kind of work would put me in the position where I would be dealing with people in that way all the time, and it led me to social work. That's cool. Yeah, so, it was yeah. cool. So um, what's the future? Actually, let's, let's talk about a little bit about what do you see? Are there emerging issues amongst our young people that the public should be learning about? I think absolutely there are. I think uh, for one thing, and this has become, it's said so often that it's becoming a bit of a cliche, but I don't think we actually really spend enough time thinking about and struggling with this issue. The, the uh, dawning of the internet age has had a profound effect on how our youth gain information and how they communicate with each other. And I don't think we're really keeping up with it. For instance, this is an unpleasant statistic to talk about, but the number of youth who become addicted to pornography is growing, and the age is becoming lower and lower. It's, mm -hmm. it's way past the time where somebody has to look for this sort of thing. Okay. If you have a handheld device or a laptop or computer, you can find it, and it doesn't matter your age, or you will find it eventually if you're online long enough. I think that's something we need to look at. But also beyond that, how youth share information and talk to each other and relate to each other. It's, it's uh, changing, I think, how sometimes our societal's values are transmitted and understood by youth, and I think it's an issue that we need to take a lot more seriously. Also, for whatever reasons, we have seen a greater increase in transgenerational issues, and by that I mean addiction that's being passed down from generation to generation, mental health issues that are being passed down from generation to generation but are not being interfered with or being looked at and examined. Uh, as we see our Latino uh, population increasing, a Latino gang involvement is becoming more of a family generational thing. Uh, it is a subcultural okay. problem that needs to be examined and understood from not just a criminal standpoint, not just a law enforcement standpoint, but as a real cultural issue standpoint. Um, I think that just in general, there is an underestimation how much pressure the youth are under today. Yeah. Okay. So if somebody wanted to learn more about Parrot Creek, where, how do they get more information? Our website's a good place to start, pcreek.org. You can go there and understand what our programs are, who some of our key staff are, and ways of donating and volunteering, or just finding out about what we do. At this time, all of our programs are through state or county contracts, mm -hmm. and so we don't take walk-in clients like that. We don't have that kind of outpatient or those kind of programs. However, we do get a lot of phone calls about that all the time, and mm -hmm. I just think it's an it's a interesting thing to find out how much our services might be touching uh, people in their lives and in the community. All right. Well, thank you for being with us this evening. Thank you for having Thank me. you for the work that you do at Parrot Creek. Thank you. Parrot Creek, celebrating their 50th anniversary, uh, pcreek.org. Well, again, once thank Greg for joining us this evening.
and for you for joining us once again on this program. Thank you. My name is Charles Shamry. I'm on to TV Toastmasters as an associate producer. I've been involved with the Portland, Salem, Beaverton, Oregon City locations for TV Toastmasters. TV Toastmasters has enhanced my ability to speak in front of a room. Not only that, but has also enhanced my ability to speak in front of a TV audience. I joined Toastmasters to improve my speaking, listening, communication, and leadership skills. Toastmasters gave me incredible confidence. 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 Great listening skills. Poise. Great leadership skills. Leadership skills. The ability to speak in public. Strength. A captive audience. Quality feedback from the more experienced Toastmasters. Toastmasters really helped me improve my listening skills. Sales skills opportunities to go to different groups and widen my whole horizon. Toastmasters has given me a better, a more focused me, and I'm a much better listener. Toastmasters is fulfilling. It's a great place to fail your way to success. Wonderful way to meet people. Networking. Strength. It's addictive. It's a club of self-improvement. It's an experience, it's a ride that you won't forget and you'll enjoy it every step of the way. Toastmasters helped me land a kick butt job. I sang at one of my table topic speeches and people liked it and applauded. My business is doing great and I'm very, very grateful to Toastmasters. It's been a great experience for me. Thank you, Toastmasters. Thank you, Toastmasters. Thank you, Toastmasters, for giving me so much confidence. Thank you, Toastmasters, for everything.